This morning we're going to be basing our message on the third chapter of the book of Jonah. It's not one of the readings for today. We'll be referring to it in some of the verses as we go through our message today from Jonah chapter 3. In the name of Jesus, our blessed Savior, our light of the world, the one who guides us and leads us into all truth. We're going to be talking about sin, repentance, and forgiveness. And some of you are saying, don't we do that every week? Yes, we do. And we want to do it, and we never want to forget it. We always need to be talking about sin, repentance, and forgiveness. These are not really trivial issues. We don't take them lightly as followers of Jesus Christ. In fact, these issues of sin and repentance and forgiveness seem to raise their heads, especially as we approach the election for a new president. In the debates, even, some of the candidates accuse others of having sinned in the past, and some of the candidates say, but I have repented, and I have sought reconciliation. And so we're hearing about sin, repentance, and forgiveness, even in the news. And we ask a question, and we're going to be talking about a city by the name of Nineveh, by the way. Can a whole city or can a whole nation be forgiven? And you see, we need to understand and we need to deal with these, these matters of sin, repentance, and forgiveness, but we have to deal with it on the basis of what God's Word says and the perspective of the good news that we hear. Now, this is what the good news tells us. The certainty of the forgiveness we need lies not in our ability to repent, but in God's mercy not to give us what we deserve for the sake of Jesus. Now, I would like you to read that with me once again. The certainty of the forgiveness we need lies not in our ability to repent, but in God's mercy not to give us what we deserve for the sake of Jesus. We're talking about grace here. We're talking about amazing grace, as we have been singing about. We're talking about God's mercy. Now we're going to talk about a city named Nineveh. Nineveh. This city, we, in this city, we see that our relenting and forgiving God takes action. Nineveh needed a forgiving God. Nineveh was a mess. This is what God said to Nineveh. He said, their evil has come up before me. Now, the book of Jonah doesn't really tell exactly what kinds of evil were going on. But the prophet Nahum later on gives us a very bleak picture of this town. He says, woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey. And then we're told, and you probably know the story, you've heard the story, that God chooses and calls a man by the name of Jonah, to go to the Ninevites and preach repentance. You must repent, you Ninevites, because of your sin. And we know that Jonah didn't go right away. He hesitated, but that's another story, and we're not really going to get into that right now. But here's what is said, what, how the story goes on. Read it with me. But the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Now, the message was very short. It wasn't a long and involved sermon. It wasn't a long and involved call to repentance. This is what was said. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. God was going to overthrow Nineveh because of their sin. And guess what? The word of God worked. The people turned to God, they believed in God, and God convicted them of their sin, and he gives them repentant hearts. Now, the king of Nineveh was so excited about this, and he gets into the act, and he commands everyone to show signs of repentance. And in those days, they put on sackcloth. And they sat in ashes. So all the people in Nineveh put on sackcloth and sat in ashes. And if this wasn't enough, the king said that he wanted the animals to wear sackcloth and sit in ashes. He was taking no chances. Everyone showed repentance. And this is what he said. Who knows, he says, God may turn 
and relent. And guess what? The story tells us that God does relent and God does forgive. And this is what he said. Read it with me. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them and he did not do it. Wow. I'm sure that as God took a look at the people of Nineveh, he was pleased and he was touched by the repentance that they showed. But I suppose very truly that it really was the promised Savior, the promised Son of God, the Lamb of God who pleased him, who was covered in blood, who came to shed blood for us that, that pleased the Father. Jesus did what the Father asked. And so he came and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us and for all people. And the father did not give the Ninevites what they deserved. And the father does not give us what we deserve. You see, God in all of his mercy looked ahead to that awful Friday. We call it Good Friday for the sake of that coming sacrifice. He did not carry through in the disaster that he planned for Nineveh. That bloody city of Nineveh was all full of lies and plunder, the scripture says, and they were spared from what it truly deserved. Now, what I am about to say will probably not sit well with everyone here today, but it is the truth that I believe that we need to talk about in our churches on the basis of scripture, especially on this January 22nd, which is the 39th anniversary of the Supreme Court's decision, Roe versus Wade decision, that legalized abortion in the United States of America. And whether you agree with me or not, the truth is that abortion has made our country a bloody country, full of lies and full of plunder, just as Nineveh was described. And like Nineveh, we need a relenting and we need a forgiving God who doesn't give us what we deserve. Now, abortion is a gruesome procedure carried out over 3,000 times every single day in this country. That is 1.2 million abortions every year. 50 million tiny Americans, vulnerable, innocent, defenseless, are struck down in one year. And our country is full of lies when it comes to the subject of abortion. Every day, thousands of women hear these lies. Lie number one says... Abortion is your only choice. That's not really true. There are other life-affirming choices and thousands of Christians, people ready to support and help women with these choices. Lie number two, don't worry, it won't hurt much. That's not true as well. Abortion hurts physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And lie number three, it will all be over soon. This is also a most deadly lie. An abortion affects a person for the rest of their life, whether they realize it or not. Believe it or not, when I tell you that Christians are the ones who have had over 70% of the abortions in our country, 70% of all abortions are had by Christians. Those who may have had an abortion may feel guilt-ridden and uncomfortable. It is not the sin of abortion that separates us from God. It is sin itself that separates us from God. And the book of Jonah does not even mention the kinds of sin that was going on in that city. It doesn't really matter whether it was the sin of witchcraft or the sin of gossiping. All the Ninevites were guilty before God and they deserved his wrath and his punishment. And when God did not carry through on the wrath that he had promised to the Ninevites, everyone's sin was covered, regardless of their sin. The size of the sin does not influence God's action. He, his relenting flows from his boundless mercy in Jesus Christ to all repentant sinners. And that goes for each one of us here today. We, you and I, are numbered with all sinners who are separated from God. We are born in this condition and we deserve God's wrath and punishment. 
And yes, thank God, we can say that God does not give us what we deserve. If we are going to change things out in our world and in our society concerning, regarding God-given value of human life, then we need to change things right here in our hearts. We need to repent of our indifference to the tragedy of abortion. We need to repent of our failure to acknowledge the spiritual aspects of life issues. We need to repent of our failure to defend the weak and the helpless and our failure to show love and compassion to those who are facing crisis pregnancies or those dealing with the sins of the past. Now, science reveals clearly the humanity of the unborn from the moment of conception. But God's word is even clearer. God's word reveals that it is much more. You see, he knows and he knew. He knew us when we were in our mother's womb and even before that point. You see, God formed that tiny human being with his hands. Jesus shed his blood on the cross for that human being. And God desires to call that human being into an eternal relationship with him. Now, our value as a human being comes, comes from what God has done and not from anything we can do. And this makes these issues more than mere social and political issues. Every life is valuable to God whether you're up and walking around, whether you're confined to a wheelchair and unable to walk, whether you're making a name for yourself or no longer able to remember anyone's name. As Christians, we are not for life and opposed to abortion because the children are precious. We are for life because the children are precious to God. And we are not for life because we live in a society that isn't, but because we serve a God who is. And so this means that speaking up for life is not an option for Christians. Last week we talked about how we're called to share the love of Christ with other people. This is all part of it. It's part of our call to be God's people in a dark world. We need to repent of the silence that we have in these matters. And when we do repent, God will look at us through the cross of Jesus and he will forgive and not bring us what our lack of respect for life deserves. He will forgive and he will give us strength to change the way that we think about these issues. Change, change in our society begins here in our church. It begins here in our heart. Now, the gospel of Jesus Christ gives us the most powerful and the most positive for life message in the universe. And it's the only message that can change hearts and minds. For we are, we, you and I, are for life people and we have a for life God. We need to educate ourselves about these issues and find out what God's word has to say about them. Lutherans for Life is a wonderful organization that can help this whole process. They produce materials that help us to learn what God says about these things. Today we'll be taking a free will offering to help Lutherans for Life in their work, and our ushers will have baskets available at the end of the service. And there's a display in the narthex from Lutherans for Life with some of their materials. You can stop by and see what they have to offer. You can give those brochures to your friends and to your family. You and I, yes, you and I, can be God's instruments in changing people's hearts and minds. Who knows? God may relent, and God may restore our country once again to a place where human life is upheld in our churches and in our society. Let's pray every day that this comes true. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.